Introducing chapter 7, Lagrange's Equations, another way of writing Newton's second law. There's just one concept in this chapter, and it is this, 7.1. Write the general prescription for solving conservative problems. So we're talking about problems with no friction, air drag, etc., etc., using Lagrange's equations. And the prescription is to first write L equals T minus U. L is called the Lagrangian. We use a script L to define it. And it is defined as the difference between T, the kinetic energy, and U, the potential energy. As you'll recall, for conservative forces, you can write the forces as minus the gradient of some potential energy. That is concept 4.10, in case you want to go back and, and re reflect on that a little bit. But we're going to write the force as the negative gradient of some potential energy. And that's what appears here. And the difference between these two, the kinetic and the potential energy, forms what is known as the Lagrangian. The magic is that this Lagrangian, the integral over the Lagrangian as a function of time, turns out to be a minimum for conservative problems. It's one of the most magical results. And so it starts to look a lot like the calculus of variations problem. So the prescription is first to write L as T minus U in terms of some generalized coordinate. We'll say more about that later. An example we'll do is with the generalized coordinate being X. But you can choose that uh, generalized coordinate as one, the one that's most natural for the problem. For the uh, simple pendulum, for example, the natural generalized coordinate is the angle theta, measured from the vertical. So uh, you write L in terms of, uh, of this generalized coordinate, and you integrate L from time t1 to time t2, integrate it over time, and this integral is a minimum. So, uh, I'm not proving that for you. I'm not sure there is a proof of it. But what we will show is that this prescription will replicate Newton's second law. So this becomes a calculus of variations problem. It looks just like the one that we had um, in concept 6.1, that S is integral x1 to x2 of f of y, y prime, and x dx. So comparing these two, the functional f is replaced by the Lagrangian, which now has some physics behind it. Uh, y is replaced by q. y prime is d, dy by dx is replaced by dq dt, q dot. And then t is, is the other variable. So it's just a variable replacement with x's replaced by t's, and uh, y, y and y prime replaced by q and q dot, and f replaced by l. Well, we know how to solve this problem. We know how to extremize this integral from concept 6.1. And the way that we can extremize it is with the Euler-Lagrange equations. Namely, the function q, in this case it's q of t, that minimizes this integral obeys Lagrange's equation. The Euler-Lagrange equation for this one was um, <coughs> df by dy minus d by dx of df by dy prime equals zero. That was the Euler-Lagrange equation. Following the same substitutions that we did before, we're going to replace f by l, y by q, 
x by t, f by l, and y prime by q dot. And these are Lagrange's equations. It's basically the same thing, just with the different variables as the Euler-Lagrange equations. So that is the end of that concept. I'm going to now do an example of how to apply that concept. Let's do one that's eminently familiar. A mass on a spring, you, uh, if the, the undisplaced spring, the unstretched, uncompressed spring, its right end would be here. If you stretch it to the right, a distance x, then the uh, kinetic energy associated with the motion there is just going to be one half m x dot squared, one half m b squared. It's oscillating back and forth, for example. Um, that's the kinetic energy. The potential energy of a spring is one half k x squared. Uh, so concepts that we did, I think, in chapter four. So L, this Lagrangian, is T minus U. <coughs> There's T, one half m x dot squared. Here's u, 1 half kx squared. Let's apply Lagrange's equations to see what happens. Now, first of all, we're going to have to decide what generalized coordinate to use. <coughs> and the answer is that there's a natural choice for this. We're going to be looking for a Lagrangian that depends on some coordinate, its time derivative, and perhaps the time. Almost always the Lagrangian will depend on a coordinate and its time derivative, and sometimes it'll depend on time. But uh, here, we have an L that depends on x, so that seems like a natural choice for the coordinate, and x dot. So that's the q and that's the q dot. So now if we rewrite this equation in terms, so that's the next step in applying Lagrange's equations, is to rewrite this in terms of your generalized coordinate, which is in our case x. So let's see what happens. dL by dx, replacing q by x, minus d by dt of dL by dx dot equals zero. Let's see what happens. <coughs> well, dL by dx, L is a function of x and x dot, but not the time t. <clears throat> so what's dl by dx? Well, there's l. Where do the x's appear in l? There's an x just right here. So dl by dx is no big deal. This term doesn't have any x's in it. It has a mass that's constant and one half that's constant and an x dot that we hold constant when we take the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to x. So this term is just a constant, its derivative is zero. And we just get a, a derivative of this term, we got a minus one half k times the derivative of x squared with respect to x. Well, that's just 2x. minus kx. Happy day. We need dl by dx dot. Well, here's l. When I take the derivative <coughs> with respect to x dot, I'm going to hold x constant this time. So that term is just a constant. And the derivative with respect to x dot will only involve this first term. Derivative of x dot squared with respect to x dot is 2x dot. Now remember, we're not taking the derivative with respect to time here. We're taking the derivative with respect to x dot while holding x and time constant. So the 2's cancel and we get mx dot. Well, now we're going to substitute those into Lagrange's equation. This term goes in there, and this term goes in there. See what happens. 
Well, dl dx is minus kx. Minus d by dt of dl by dx dot. dl by dx dot is just mx dot. And that is supposed to equal zero. Let me write this in another way. Uh, first of all, let me take this term over to the right-hand side, so it becomes positive. And then let me take this derivative, d by dt of mx dot. Mass is a constant. Derivative of x dot with respect to time is, m, is x double dot. So on the, on the right-hand side, I have mx double dot. That's the right-hand side, which I'm going to convert to the left-hand side, equals minus kx. Well, I hope that you'll see here that mx double dot is a net force in the x direction. Mass times, I'm sorry, is mass times acceleration. in the vector form and so that's the mass times acceleration in the x-direction and on the right-hand side I've got the sum on forces in the x-direction which you guessed it that's just Hooke's law we don't have one force and it's Hooke's law so we have recovered a known result, one that we could have gotten from Newton's second law, using Lagrange's equations. The proof that um, Lagrange's equations is, gives the same physics as Newton's second law can be done more generally than this, but I think this is enough to show you and make you believers that, that Lagrange's equations um, work. So when you think about other problems, like for example, the pendulum problem, and I'll give you this one as a homework uh, problem. Pendulum mass length, angle theta, uh, you have a mass m here on the end of the pendulum and it's in the, in the presence of gravitational field. This one works out just way simply with uh, Lagrange's equations. You're going to write down the Lagrangian is t minus u. That's always your first step. You write what down what the, what the uh, kinetic energy is, what the potential energy is, uh, figure out what the generalized coordinate is, which is going to be theta, and then you'll end up with theta double dot is minus g over l sine theta when you apply Lagrange's equations. And it is far and away the simplest way to solve the pendulum problem.